minutes of presentation, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. Uh, during the talk, questions will be limited to clarifying questions, and you can ask them in the chat. Um, Diego and Maripath are online, so they might answer a few of the questions. Um, and the, during the Q&A, you'll be able to ask the questions directly to the speaker. This seminar will be recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel very soon. That's all on our part. Thank you, Antonio, for joining us today. The floor is yours. All right. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a, it's a real honor uh, to, be, to be here. And um, I'll just you know, start. So as you've mentioned, this is joint work with, with Pablo, Maripaz, and Diego. At least Maripaz and Diego are around, so, so they'll be able to answer uh, questions. Um, <clears throat> OK, so by way of, uh, of motivation, um, let me show you a couple of graphs. Um, then I'll tell you why they are about motivation. But, but first, the, the graph. So these are two graphs that are related to climate change. And as you can see, the graph on the right is about predictions of what's going to happen depending on what we do uh, about climate change. And interestingly, uh, the graph in the past is about the, you know, the, what has happened so far and in fact the uncertainty surrounding the, the contribution. So one reason why this is relevant is up to now, and I think even in the last uh, report of the IPCC and International Panel for Climate Change, uh, they, they give you just confidence bands on what are going to be, you know, things that happen in the future, depending on what we do today. They don't even give you the distribution, they just give you the, the confidence interval, which given what we're going to talk about today is very, <clears throat> is very reminiscent. And same thing about the past, they, they, they don't, they will know very much exactly what's the contribution of different things. And these things in principle could matter for what, uh, for what we can do and we want to do. So more generally, the motivation is, <clears throat> uh, and you'll see the, the game that we're going to, to discuss, is many projects that humans want to do require joint efforts. And then there are big uncertainties surrounding both the impact of, uh, of the effort and also the possibility that, that the effort you know, uh, is successful or not, or what happens when we don't make efforts. So that's the... Uh, that's a motivation for what we're doing. And I, I told you that I was going to tell you why this might be a bad motivation. So I presented this in front of uh, climate, you know, uh, you know, environmental economists, you know, a few weeks ago. And they said, oh, the, you know, the experiment per se is very interesting, but, you know, I don't trust your results in terms of climate change because climate change is about something that actually is a, is a big threat for humanity and we're really risking everything on this, uh, on this uh, event. And how can I uh, trust the results of an, ex an experiment in which people have, uh, have, you know, are putting at risk at most a few euros of their, of their money? Which is a fair criticism, I would say, a standard criticism about the external validity. But if that's true, I'm not even sure what are we doing when we're doing uh, lab experiments. So it, it left me a bit, um, you know, frustrated. Uh, so if, maybe in the Q and A we can we can discuss about this. But um, re in reality, what we want to talk about is this: is a situation in which people need to do stuff so that something good happens or something bad is prevented. And they need to do it together, but there is uncertainty, and there is uncertainty of a particularly badly uh, developed way. So that's really a repetition of what you we, what were saying. So uh, social projects that require complementary investments, there are badly defined uncertainties, and there are you know, obvious examples about this I mentioned there. Um, now, the implication of the fact that probabilities are ambiguous are not completely clear examples. So without, we're going to have a theoretical model later, but without uh, you know, thinking too deeply about this, one could think, well, the usual way we handle uh, ambiguous uncertainties in, uh, in economics is by focusing on a pessimistic scenario. Now, if we do focus on a pessimistic scenario, superficially it looks like we should make more effort <clears throat> on the other hand 
uh, pessimism can also affect not just the chance of success of the, of, of the of the effort, but also you know the effort itself. It might be that we start being pessimistic about the effort being uh, effective at all. Um, so those two things seem you know in principle could go in, in different directions. Perhaps more importantly for what we'll uh, tell you later, the complementarities in this case <clears throat> are something that usually we don't uh, look at too much when we think about uh, you know, decision problems with ambiguity. And, and here complementarities are key. And this means that I not only need to worry about, uh, about the objective probabilities of something happening or not, I also worry about the willingness to act of others in that kind of environment precisely. And I think that's what complicates things and makes this uh, somehow more challenging. In fact, much more challenging than the, than the simplistic theory that I would present. Okay, so what is it that we do exactly this summarizing and then I'll, I'll go into detail. We're doing a randomized online experiment with a representative sample of a medium-sized country, in this case, Spain. Participants are going to play a threshold public good experiment and they contribute to avoid probabilistically a bad outcome. There's going to be uncertainty about two things. One is the chance to avoid the bad outcome. And second, there's going to be uncertainty about the threshold by which you can avoid this bad outcome. Because there's uncertainty about these two uh, parameters and you know, there can be ambiguity on both dimensions, we're going to have a two by two uh, treatment in which is you know, uncertainty is ambiguous or not on the two dimensions. In addition, we're also going to measure after the treatment uh, several things like risk aversion, ambiguity aversion, uh, CRT, social preferences, time preferences, math ability, and there will be a large uh, social demographic question that I'll discuss in a second. Okay, in case you need to run before uh, long, uh, here's a summary of the result. The average treatment is a very precise node, very precise because we have lots of observations for all treatments, at least uh, that's what we find. Uh, interestingly, uh, both risk aversion and ambiguity aversion significantly de decrease contributions, but they do so in all treatments, not in one uh, or the other, in all of them. Also, risk aversion <clears throat> and ambiguity aversion are quite correlated, but not perfectly so. And there are some small interaction effects, but given you know, how many of them we looked at and so on, we cannot say really that the null effects are really masking large, but maybe opposite effects in different subgroups. So I, I, like I said from the beginning, it looked like you could go in one direction or the other. So one thing we worried when we saw the average treatment effect being null, we said, hmm, Maybe this is because, I don't know, risk averse people are, are contributing less, but you know, risk loving people are contributing more and somehow they, they cancel. Truth is no, uh, it's all in the same, uh, it's, it's all in the same uh, direction. Okay, so in terms of literature, uh, I'm not going to go into much detail, but there is some uh, theoretical, uh, contribution that Milner did some here that say that ambiguity should, in principle, increase investment in climate change. It actually, in the little kind of toy model that we use, it does so. Um, Berger and Bossetti have an interesting, very interesting uh, experiment where they show that policymakers are ambiguity averse. So they conducted this uh, at the, in fact, the Paris uh, uh, Climate uh, Summit. Uh, but this is in a, in a decision theoretic framework it, and it's not framed in terms of climate they're just trying to test whether the policymaker in the summit were ambiguity averse and it turns out yeah um <clears throat> then there's a bunch of uh, more or less field or lab in the field experiments that under different you know circumstances show that farmers for example invest more in adaptation if risk is ambiguous and if coordination uh, is required Daugherty and company, they, they show that ambiguity climate reduces index insurance demand, which kind of goes a little bit in the opposite direction. Actor and Bennett, <coughs> ambiguity decreases willingness to pay for abatement. Um, then there's a couple of uh, important experiments in this literature on climate change. So Manfred Milinski and his co-authors uh, do a dynamic threshold public uh, good climate change game, in which basically 
uh, people contribute to a round number of rounds. And if by the end enough has been contributed, you avoid a disaster, and otherwise not. So they, uh, they showed that a large risk uh, increases contributions. So the larger the risk, the more contributions. And a different paper by Darenberg and companies it does the same experiment, but with ambiguity. And in the uh, design, ambiguity reduces contributions, which kind of goes a little bit against the theory and, and some of the other results. So I think in summary, the literature has not settled on what's going on. So we're trying to contribute something to that literature. Okay, so let me now go more concretely into the, <laughs> into the design. Like I said, we have uh, four treatments, and there's going to be either risk or ambiguity in both uh, the threshold and the probability of averting a disaster. So those are the four treatments. Now, uh, let me just show you a little bit how the instructions look like. We don't frame it in a climate se uh, sense. So... Uh, the framing is one in which is a group of five people. The high five people have a total amount of 25 euros at their disposal uh, in, a, in a strong box for them, so five per person. Now, the problem is that there is a thief that might want to open the strong box and, and steal the money. And in that case, everything disappears. Now, to prevent it, you need uh, you know, a technician to actually reinforce the strong box with an you know, anti, anti theft system. And here is where the uncertainty comes. Now, if um, you pay enough, and the enough is, is what's going to be, is one of the things that is going to be uh, uncertain, if you pay enough to the, uh, to the technician, then if you pay enough, you avoid the, 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 thief, the, the thieves stealing with 90% probability. If you don't pay enough, you avoid with 10% stealing. This is in the pure risk frame, not the ambiguity. So it's 90% or 10% if you pay enough. And how much is enough? In the risk frame is either 5 euros or 10 euros with 50% probability. That is an average contribution or either 1 or 2 euros with uh, the same probability. So that's the kind of a standard uh, risk uh, treatment. Now, the ambiguity treatments uh, are in, you know, are three different ones. One in which there's ambiguity about the threshold, if, sorry, ambiguity about the probability. If there's ambiguity about the probability, we tell you that <clears throat> if you pay enough, at most 20% uh, of the thieves will be able to steal. Uh, and if you don't pay enough, at least 80% of the thieves will be able to steal but you don't specify how much, just at most 20 or at least uh, 80. And then uh, when, the, when the threshold is the thing that is ambiguous, you say that the sufficient price for the technician might be some number between five and 10, and you don't say anything, more. Just, just an interval, five, between something between five and 10. So those are the four treatments that are uh, present in the experiment. Okay. Okay, in terms of covariates that we're using, uh, we have a few uh, in there, like uh, we use the same graphic designer, by the way, it's a, it was a master's student, so it did a, you know, I think a very nice job. Um, I think he's in Berlin now uh, doing his uh, PhD. Um, so this, uh, so the, there's an ambiguity aversion test, which is basically, uh, there's a box with ambiguous uh, probabilities and then you are told you can either take the, uh, you know, the box and then uh, you will obtain, you know, um, I think it's, there's, there's balls of, uh, I think it's apples that are either green or red. And, and if the apple that shows up ends up being red, uh, then extracted is red, then you get two euros, otherwise you get nothing. You're not told the probabilities and then you can either take the red or sell it. And then uh, the sale is, uh, in a sense, the measure of, of your ambiguity aversion, the sale price. We do the same thing also to measure risk aversion, but in that case, uh, we are told that there are five uh, green apples and, and, and uh, uh, five red apples. Okay, And then you're told you can either take the bet or sell the box to someone else and then get the price. Okay, So those are standard. Uh, 
um, uh, risk and ambiguity aversion tests. We also have measured social preferences in the idea that maybe I mean, this is the, this game has a flavor of um, you know there's some cooperation involved in this game, so we thought maybe um, maybe social preference would play a role in something. And so we asked people to play several dictator games, one of which would be chosen for payment. This is an example, one of the examples of one of the dictator games, one in which you have to choose one for you and one for the other person. And uh, an option is uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.8 for you and 1.6 for the other person. And there are, I think, uh, six or five, no, six of these games that are presented in which we try to measure whether a person is altruistic, spiteful, I mean, the usual thing. Oh, okay. Sorry, there's a quick yes. question by Luca Rigotti. Yeah. How is the actual outcome chosen in the ambiguous treatments? Ah, uh, um, we used a kind of complicated procedure that we found in a paper so that this was not transparent to us. Um, I'm pretty sure Diego is going to remember the answer, but we, I mean, we. We tried to do this in a kind of standard way for someone that has done this experiment before. Of course, one of the problems, if you know the probabilities, then it's, it's a bit of an issue, but uh, we tried to use a, a, um, a procedure that was blind to us. Uh, so that it was also ambiguous to us, let's say. Okay, so we measure also cognitive reflection, uh, with the, we do a cognitive re reflection test, thinking you maybe people that are kind of uh, less impulsive <clears throat> might take decision in a different way. Uh, simple math comprehension test, simply to, uh, to see if people that are more math sophisticated were doing more things. Remember, this is a, we're using a representative sample in the population, so many different levels of education and so on. So we thought perhaps uh, people don't understand probabilities and people who do understand probability behave in a different way. We did a non-incentivized time preferences test. This was a one-shot online survey, so we didn't want to actually do go through a whole process of you know waiting and paying them later. So it was a purely you know a hypothetical question in this case. And then a sociodemographic <clears throat> questionnaire where we measure gender, education, profession, income, political preferences social attitudes, you know, bunch, very large number of questions. Okay, so now we can go to the, to the data and the samples. So this is a representative sample of the Spanish population. As you can see, we had <clears throat> 1,500 people. And you can see that the proportions in the sample and the population were fairly similar, as one would expect. So the, the surveyors did their job in terms of the proportions here. Um, <clears throat> in terms of age, uh, we also wanted to do it, um, <coughs> sorry, representative in age, uh, gender and education. So, <coughs> sorry, all these things we had um, enough, and there are five levels of education. <coughs> And then age that was going from 18 to 74. Okay, I think I need to get out glass of water. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> okay, so like I said, representative in terms of age, uh, gender, education, <clears throat> on top of regional. And you can see that, uh, you know, there's nothing particularly here. Um, 
these are not the balance test, I think. These are just the summary statistics. So this is fine. So in terms of balance across treatments, we achieve balance in almost everything except age for one of the treatments. So I think that should be fine, given there are so many things that are going on. OK, so theory and hypothesis. So <clears throat> given the gain that we are constructing, it's relatively simple to have a theoretical benchmark, at least for one of the usual theories that is used in this, uh, in this context. So notice that the way you get paid is you have five, which is your endowment, minus your contribution times the probability that the contribution is sufficient to avoid the, the disaster. And, uh, and then in the benchmark, the price of the safety lock is either five or 10 with one half probability each. The probability of no theft without the safety lock is 4.9. And therefore, the probability uh, is the one that we depict in there. The nice thing about this is if we now use <clears throat> as a theoretical benchmark, again, I'm, I'm emphasizing this because I see some theorists in the audience. This is a very naive benchmark, but it's a kind of a simple one. We do a mean max model then uh, you want to maximize your utility for the minimum probability in the set and the minimum probability is relatively easily calculated in this case and then uh, so choose the for each ci choose the lowest possible probability that's you know a reasonable mean max benchmark most games that you would care to uh, toy with would not be so easy, but we just happen to have a game that in which uh, applying the mean max is, uh, is simple. <clears throat> okay, under these circumstances, uh, we have, we can um, check what are the equilibria, and of course we check the equilibria under different configurations, but uh, if everyone is, is this neutral, then there's, you know, C equal 10 is always an equilibrium, uh, and then C equal five as a total contribution. So let's call C the total contribution of the team. So there can be three levels of, uh, of total contribution that are candidates to equilibrium, at least symmetric equilibrium. Uh, and under you know, risk neutral preferences, you have there. Uh, now, if there are at least some risk loving people, then, uh, then you start having less equilibrium. Uh, and, and in fact, that allows us to make a relatively nice um, characterization. We know that usually in most games, in particular in this one, we can test. In fact, we, we find there are some people that are risk-loving. Uh, in that case, uh, then with ambiguity, uh, only the C equal 10 is an equilibrium, and C equal 10 is not an equilibrium because the risk-loving people wouldn't contribute uh, enough to get to the equilibrium in that case. <clears throat> so uh, under complete ambiguity, only C equal 10 is an equilibrium. Under C equal 5, only uh, 5 is an equilibrium. And uh, under uh, risk risk, so risk in all dimensions, so risk in the, in the dimension of the probabilities, then the C is an equilibrium. And that kind of suggests that ambiguity in principle should increase contributions in these games. And we have a relatively clear uh, set of hypotheses here at the test. Now, the reason why this is, <clears throat> um, there are many reasons why this is naive, but one reason this is naive is that we don't have any uncertainty whatsoever about what the others are going to contribute. So people know this is an equilibrium, so people know what others are going to contribute, there's no uncertainty about that. And if that and, and then the only uncertainty that remains is the one of the environment of the parameters in the environment. Under these circumstances, this is the hypothesis. Okay, now <clears throat> this allows us to go relatively quickly into the results, and then you can see that uh, these are the main contributions across treatments, and you. You know, you see that there's not uh, much difference. Then we'll do some regressions later, but to me, this is already a punchline. So mean contribution in the public good games across treatments <clears throat> is basically the same. Notice these are relatively large contributions also in the sense that, that at, you, you need 10 
uh, euros to to uh, to avoid the disaster. So it's almost always avoided. So it's people contribute more than necessary um, in all treatments. Now, um, <clears throat> so if you, on the other hand, look at people that are either risk lower or risk neutral and risk averse, or and ambiguity lower and ambiguity neutral and ambiguity averse, uh, then what you find is uh, sort of the opposite. Actually, I'm hesitating now because. Hmm. I'm I'm hesitating now. I, I know that Diego is around, but I thought that the last that the last results we have. So I may have used the wrong the wrong graphs here um, because I thought that <clears throat> the panel representing risk lower is the one that contributes less. So that's the right hand side, and the panel that we get over is also the, the right hand side panel. So Diego, are you around to? Maybe contradict me if I'm if I'm wrong. Sorry, I cannot see him. So I Diego, don't... can you unmute yourself or can you see now? Yeah. Oh, we can. We cannot hear you. Um, perhaps if you take the headphones off, okay, that might work. Or... So I think I think the, the I think the um, the legend in this in this graph is wrong. I think risk lower is the one. Ah no, sorry, sorry. Ah, I was confused. I'm sorry. I'm, it's my fault. It's it's risk lower has no more contribution. No, I thought risk lower was less contributions. So that's why I'm passing. Okay, so <clears throat> let me show you the regressions because uh, I think the panels here are wrongly labeled. If you go to the regressions, you can see <clears throat> here a bit more clearly when you when you write ambiguity aversion. So these are the same the you know the same results, and you can see that the uh, we have the treatments here. So baseline is risk risk. So the you know where the probabilities are well defined, and you can see that the average treatment effects are at zero. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and then you see that beliefs, so if you believe that others are going to contribute more, then of course you're going to contribute more. Of course, that doesn't, doesn't change. So that's, that's it. That's, of course, natural because this is a game of strategic complements. And then when you, you can see here that ambiguity aversion has a negative sign. So the more ambiguity averse people are, the less they contribute. Um, but if we interact this with the treatments, then, then they lose significance. <clears throat> and in any case, I think that this is this third column is the is the relevant one. So ambiguity averse people do contribute less in this game. Uh, something similar happens with risk aversion. So uh, again, beliefs still matter, but risk aversion is clearly negative. Now there are some significant interactions here with a couple of the treatments. I think the most important bit is, is this, that risk averse people contribute less, and that's slightly mitigated in the, in, in the more ambiguous uh, treatments. But, you know, generally speaking, uh, risk averse and ambiguity averse people contribute less. Okay, we tried other interactions. Uh, <clears throat> We thought that there's there's some evidence that uh, you know females have a different attitude toward risk, so we thought perhaps that makes a difference. They also often contribute more in contribution games, so I thought perhaps this makes a difference. I could not, we could not see any interaction with gender. Uh, we have uh, that you know um, people CRT, so high CRT are, are um, more less impulsive people so more reflective or less impulsive people so more reflective people contribute a bit less uh, but you know the order of magnitude is is not very large and math ability doesn't seem to make a difference and certainly the interactions of, of this don't make a big difference <clears throat> now the um the belief results are are, are important because we, we're trying to see why is it that people 
uh, particularly ambiguity averse and risk averse people contribute less. It's not <clears throat> extremely clear uh, in the in the risk in the ambiguity averse people. So here there is a negative sign, but it's not hugely significant. But it's more uh, significant under risk aversion. So under risk aversion, you can see that people who are risk averse believe that others are going to contribute less. So it's this. So these two things tie well together. So the risk averse people are more pessimistic about the contributions of others, and as, as a result, they contribute less. So it's this uh, interaction of beliefs that I, I you know, it, it's probably making a difference in, with respect to the contributions of the <clears throat> of the players, in particular the risk averse players. And, so uh, Antonio, let, let me uh, ask you a couple of questions. So there was yeah. one about beliefs. Now that you talk about beliefs. Um, how did you elicit beliefs regarding others' contributions? Uh, that's from Alex Valek. I think we just asked them, how much do you think that people in your group are going to contribute overall? We didn't give them like an interval. So nothing complicated saying how much others are going to contribute. And we pay them for accuracy. So the closer your, uh, your statement is to the actual contribution, then the more you are. There's uh, another question from Karl Schlag. Uh, there's no treatment effect. Can you refute that they simply did not understand your design of, of treatments? I'm not sure how we could do that. Um, the <clears throat> so let me turn the question around slightly. I think it is quite possible that for majority of people, ambiguity and risk are somehow equivalent in their minds or there's, there's not much difference. It's like, I don't care if it's uh, something between 0 0.8 and all I know it's, there's an uncertainty. To me, it's a large uncertainty. The precise number is not so much, is not so important. For, let's say, a normal person in the street, the difference between 0 0.8 and 1, we care a, a lot about this because we, we, we've been trained in probability theory. We, we kind of, um, you know, idolatrize these numbers or something. But most people, you know, that's, I mean, that's an educated guess. So it's not so much that they don't understand our design, is that people have a relationship with probabilities that is less kind of uh, precise than our scientist minds will tell us. <clears throat> yeah, perhaps we can leave it here and then we can uh, go back to it at the, at the, at the Q&A since you're already showing the, the conclusion. Yeah, I mean, we're almost done here. Um, yeah. So conclusion is, OK, we've done a large online experiment to test the impact of ambiguity in a threshold probability game. Main result is ambiguity does not have an effect. Or it's not one that we can see. <clears throat> an additional result is risk averse people contribute less. I think that's relevant. And if you wanted a tentative policy implication is um, let's try to reduce the uncertainty and risk, or maybe present it in a way that somehow concentrates on, on the fact that there are some things that we do know. We do know that if we don't contribute enough, we're certain that, um, I don't know, sea, sea level is going to rise by at least one meter. It may be more, but it may, it may be enough to try to communicate people in a way that we deal with the known facts uh, and maybe forget about the unknown unknowns and the known unknowns and all that thing. Just concentrate on the things that we know for sure, because what we know for sure is, is pretty damning already. So maybe we don't need to, con to concentrate on the things that we are, you know, it's less known. And of course, more research is needed. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Antonio. Uh, uh, 
um, for, for a very nice presentation. Uh, we have some interesting questions in the chat. Now we, we're gonna open the Q&A and we have quite some time. Uh, so feel free to unmute yourself and uh, and ask the questions directly to to Antonio, uh, Diego, and Maripaz. Um, uh, so, Kavi, I had some questions in the chat. Would you would you like to to bring them to the arena? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to? I'm happy with it. Um, to get to ask the final question, um, you said that it's good in your policy implications to reduce uncertainty. Um, where in your findings did you have that? So oh, I yeah, we know that risk averse people contribute less. So if risk, I mean, this is tentative. That's why I said it's tentative. But if we presented the risk, the people that are risk averse, so that's you know, it's a, you know significant majority of people that are risk averse. We presented with situations in which we dispense with the uncertainty. We just present the, the, the kind of known facts. My conjecture is that they might be more willing to contribute. So it's <clears throat> they don't like the idea of, well, this might happen, this might not, thing might happen. So it's a hypothesis, if you want, more than an implication. It's a sure. hypothesis for an implication. It could have been tested, though, I think. It could have been tested now on this one. You could have had smaller or larger intervals or changed that, right? Yeah. And then you could have tested it directly if this was one thing you're interested yeah, in. Yeah, but, but this, like is, this is exposed, uh, Carl, so we, we no, did. No, no, but, it's a, but I'm saying, it, but you didn't have that variation when I'm saying in the treatments. I think it's a very interesting I mean, experiment. Often we have exposed things that open up new questions. No, I think that's very good. My other question was about the um, the null. So is it not possible when you compare the different thresholds or the different variations within a treatment to show that people were reactive to some degree? Because otherwise you always have the criticism that null results are just because people don't understand. So we wanna make, so the question is, can you show through some variations in the behavior that actually did understand, except that the difference between the treatments didn't matter. That would be the way to prove that you have your treatments were not um, yeah. just um, you know, ignored. Because otherwise, and null, that's what is the problem about nulls. It's very hard to um, make implications from null because it just might be that you, they didn't understand it. So you, what you're saying is there was some variation in behavior, it's just not, not enough to... <clears throat> no, I'm just saying that there was um, this kind of variation didn't play a role in comparing between the treatments, but the treatment exact itself was understood because when the variations within the treatment basically led to things that we would have thought would be plausible to somehow understand that they're reacting correctly to the information they're giving. That's the way that I would uh, go about it. Otherwise you really don't, it's very difficult to, to accept the null. Okay. Um... I mean, the closest I can get to that is, is, is uh, when we show that risk covers people contribute less uh, in the sense that this means that the <clears throat> presentation made a difference uh, to them. They, you know, but I'm not quite sure that goes sufficiently in the, um, yeah. Okay, so I think I need to think about this. And are there are there any questions? Any other questions? So th there was one one question in the chat, uh, which was about uh, from Gai and I. Is my understanding uh, correctly that ambiguity decreased the negative effect of risk aversion? Uh, that's something that. Sorry, sorry. Can you repeat that? Uh, um, is uh, is my understanding correct uh, that ambiguity decreased the negative effect of risk aversion? That's one result. Ah, uh, no, no. But, I think he, this person means this. Um, sorry, it's, wait, uh, here. <clears throat> it's not, Yes, okay, okay, I see. That's correct. So some forms of ambiguity uh, reduce the effect of risk aversion. That's correct. 
That's that's what we have in here. Uh, but it's a little bit difficult. In fact, it completely cancels. So the effect of uh, uh, of this ambiguity completely destroys the effect of risk aversion in terms of contribution for this treatment. And I, I would say probably similarly for this treatment in here. So this is the so the whole effect of risk aversion in a way. Maybe another way to present this, and maybe that's that's how we should present this in the past, is the whole effect of risk aversion comes from this treatment. Uh, sorry, this. Ah, where did I lose this? This treatment over here. The treatment with ambiguity in one dimension and risk in the other. Um, that's probably true. I, I need, we need to do some more tests, but. But I think that's correct. So this one treatment in which risk aversion makes a big difference is not clear that in the other two treatments are all that different from the baseline. That's right. And, and so the, the sorry, just to just to understand. So the omitted is RR, which is uh, risk. They know the probabilities and they know the they know. Yeah. So this is an AR. So the AR is only in the probability, but not in the threshold. Right. Um, there's another question in the chat. Uh, feel free to unmute yourselves and, and, and ask the question directly uh, to Antonio. But I'm going to read, in the meantime, I'm going to read the ones from the chat. Uh, so uh, Luca Rigotti has a question uh, related to Carl's question. Uh, did you ask? If they understand the probability structure in the risk-only treatment. Well, we have a we have a test not on probability, but there's a, one of the covariants is <clears throat> a math comprehension test, which should be related to you know probability test and. Um, we, when we did the interaction here, we didn't find anything. So it's not like the more math <clears throat> able people, and I suspect that the, I mean, I'm almost certain that the most math able people understood what we mean by probability, and then um, their behavior is not different, at least with respect to. Uh, Antonio, the reason why I ask is because we know the subjects are bad at doing compounding, which is part of your structure to begin with. And that compounding and ambiguity aversion can interact in, in kind of funny ways. And so it would be good to have a sense of, you know, can they compound correctly, at least in the risk only treatment in which that there's no ambiguity and then how this compounding thing get affected by that, right? Because you have this complicated structure in which the ability to compound probability correctly is crucial to understand mm -hmm. what's going on. That's why I ask. Okay. Um, yeah. So the only thing we have is this math comprehension test. That's the closest we can get there. And it doesn't seem to play a role, but um, we don't have anything more direct. <clears throat> but thanks for the question. Thanks for the answer. <laughs> We have another question by Salvo. He has a, a newborn sleeping right next door, so he cannot speak himself. But he did write the question in the chat, so let me read it out. Um, do you think ambiguity would be more relevant with experience and feedback on others' participant behavior? I guess there was no repetition and no feedback given this was done online and asynchronously. That's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> If I had to guess, I would say there will be. And in fact, one of the things we're definitely planning to do, so of course, there are many things one could do extra, but one of the things we're planning to do is a, is a more kind of lab. So not such a large experiment. We're not going to be able to pay for another 1,500 you know, people sample. But with a smaller experiment, maybe only with students, try to see if, if repetition makes a difference, because there is some prior evidence that, um, that contributions decline over time in, in games of this sort and uh, with repetition. And that might 
that might be important. Maybe that there is an interaction with ambiguity in that case that that uh, we don't know. Excellent. We still have time for some other questions. Check the chat that this I didn't miss any other question. Anything? Any other question? Oh, there's something in the chat. Uh, yes. Um, Manelva Usails asks, uh, what could be some interventions based on this research? So that's a good question because, in fact, we have a, a proposal coming from a foundation that, that was interested in these results and wants to help us. So if you have any ideas, we're more than happy to, to entertain them at the present moment. Um, we are thinking that maybe <clears throat> given that people are, are not so reactive to the, to the you know, specific form of presenting uncertainty. Um, it could be that they 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 want something a bit more emotional so that you know the world is going to end and you know things are going to be a disaster. And uh, I suspect that that's going to be even something very imprecise like we're going to a catastrophe. Uh, might be more even if it's very imprecise and very ambiguous might be more appealing for people to contribute than, than giving them very precise numbers. So <clears throat> that, yeah, I mean, that, that, that I, I suspect that that's the case. Uh, and, and this is one of the things that we want to track. But if you have other ideas, I'm, you know, we're very uh, happy to entertain them. Right, any other question? There's another question, by the way, um, you're free to admit yourself if, if you wish to ask the question to the, uh, directly. I'm gonna read the ones that come from the chat. So Blanca Tena from Unicastle asks, why didn't you frame it under an environmental context? We thought that we would have a confound between the pure ambiguity and the, in fact, uh, a kind of emotional aspect of the of the uh, of environment. So we thought that if we just make environment, given the salience that the topic has right now, and how much the, the press is talking about it, so um, we thought hmm, this might be leading people into making a lot of contributions and we wanted to see what happens in a, in a slightly more sterile environment. Um, in fact, we know for different, we've, we've been doing some you know, web scraping, knowing mentions of climate change in different outlets, so in the press, in the media, in scientific publications, in the speeches of the European Parliament, the European Central Bank, and. Uh, so some of the some of the of the results are quite uh, quite remarkable. So European Central Bank, for example, was not talking at all about uh, climate change until one or two years ago, and now climate change appears in like forty percent of the of the speeches and documents that come out of the European Central Bank. So this is really remarkable. Uh, European Parliament uh, has been going at it for a bit longer, but, but it's relatively recent, maybe, you know, decade, decade and a half or something like this. Um, so <clears throat> it's enough in the, in the media, it, it has had some cycles, but recently it has an upward uh, 
uh, trend, a uh, very remarkable uh, upward trend. So, so that it could be that you know we were a bit worried about uh, this being a bit uh, you know polluted by by this uh, you know upsurge of interest in in in. Um, Antonio, I have a very unfair question. Now that you see the null results, if you could change the design in any way, how would you change it in the hope of getting actual treatment effects? That's a good question. So one thing that definitely we would probably should have done is have a, a treatment without any uncertainty. So that so rather than having ninety percent and twenty ten percent, just nothing. It's certain or nothing. Threshold, same thing. Uh, just one threshold rather than this uh, fifty fifty chance. Um, and this plus repetition are the two things that that I that are kind of most salient in my mind, and we're kind of certain that we're going to do this uh, one way or the other. Um, Thank you. There's another question by, by Salvo. Um, you probably discussed this in the literature review, but is the lack of treatment effect at odds with what we know from the experimental literature and ambiguity in individual decision-making tasks? Well, um, I mean, Yes and no, in the sense that, that there are results in going in both directions. There, at least a, as far as I could see, there are very few known results. There's, uh, there are some results that say that in a pure decision context, uh, you get to contribute more. Uh, there's less in a strategic concept, there's next to nothing. Uh, but what, what I find that is closest seems to indicate less contribution. Uh, rather than more contribution, as the theory would predict. My, I mean, if I now, and we probably should do a pre-registration of the future experiment, if I had to pre-register, say, with repetition, I am trying to guess that we're going to get less contribution over time. Um, I'm, since we have time, I'm going to make a comment rather than a question. You have a framework of what theorists would call objective uh, probabilities in which they're sort of, and it's kind of hard to think about models with objective ambiguity, right? Most of the theories that we know of tend to be subjective rather than objective. And there is a little bit of a, tension between you know ambiguity is the way we think about it is differences in perception of or not being sure about probabilities but then having machines generate the probability themselves the two things at least philosophically to me conflict and it's kind of hard to out to reconcile and this is not about your paper everybody does this that's why i say it's not a question it's just a comment <laughs> Mm -hmm. is a comment in general it's uh that might be one of the sources of the null results as well uh but i don't know i'm just speculating yeah i think what what you're saying is um lab experiments that actually reflect uh what decision theorists think it's ambiguity are next to impossible uh which which is probably true. Uh, I, I, I don't know if they are impossible. Surely they are hard. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's uh, for somewhat similar reasons. Uh, so I, I remember that when, when um, Rosemary Nagel did her first experiment on uh, on uh, on the uh, Morishin game, uh, she found that there was basically well, um, Frank Heinemann and I think Ockenfels as well. I don't know. So there's 
you know, they found that the, there was no difference in the in the treatment with uh, with, with just just have a standard coordination game in in the and in the game in which you have uh, kind of some exogenous uncertainty that you put in that looks like the ones in the model of Morishin. And, uh, <clears throat> and she was puzzled by this. And I remember one day we were, you know, discussing this with Steve Morris and, and he said, you know, the, the, the reality is that in my mind, uh, the two treatments are identical in the sense that a lot of the uncertainty that, you know, people have is in their minds and, the, and you know, it's a recent paper by Salvo that goes in, in this direction that, that makes this uh, quite explicit. So it's, uh, I think it's what you're saying is totally fair. It just says that it's very difficult to do a, a good experiment that reflects the way decision theorists think about ambiguity. That's, I think that's a totally fair. Uh, so this one, it was a fair, a fair criticism. <laughs> Right, unless there's any other question or comment, uh, that might be a good moment to, to stop since it's two minutes to five uh, here in the UK. Thank you so much, Antonio, for, for the, the talk today. Uh, this is the last vibes of this year, of 2021. Um, thank you, not only you, Antonio, but also Diego, Maripath, and, and all of you for joining us. We're going to continue in 2022, and we're going to continue in February after the fever of the job market. Uh, in February 8th, we're going to have uh, Shang Li. So enjoy the holidays. Hopefully, we'll be able to travel safely home. And uh, yeah, see you next year. Thank you very Thank you, much. Everybody. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you so much, Antonio.